So what are we going to do with these observables once we have them? And the most common thing that we want to do is we have some correlator, a two-point correlator, a three-point correlator. And we know from QCD, from theory, what we expect the form of that data to be. We might not know the exact values, but we know basically what we expect the shape to be. It's a sum over exponentials, for example. The most common fit in lattice QCD is just obtaining the energy of some quantum state from its two-point correlator. So consider taking some ensemble of QCD vacuum, you use your supercomputer, you calculate a bunch of valence quark propagators. You take an operator to create a nucleon at some given space-time location. We allow it to propagate through this lattice, that is by using our valence quark propagators, and then we annihilate it at some later time. By looking at the Euclidean time dependence of this two-point correlator, we'll be able to extract the energy. And the reason for that is pretty simple. If we just write down a nucleon operator, we'll call it J sub n for nucleon, we calculate its two-point correlator, this expectation value over Jn, it's earlier time, some later time. Notice we're talking about actual space-time time, not Monte Carlo time anymore. The operator will pick up a tower of states with the nucleon's quantum numbers. Well, what does that mean? We're trying to get the ground state nucleon, but we don't just get the ground state nucleon. We get anything that has the quantum numbers of the operator that we just put on here, unless we've somehow magically discovered the exact wave function of the ground state, we'll actually have an overlap with the ground state, excited states, some huge number of different states, which we can represent this way, the sum over all of those states, which we index by n, this overlap between the creation operator and that state, this overlap between that state having propagated across the lattice and the annihilation operator, and there will be a factor of e to the minus e sub n of t, e sub n being the energy of this state. So the goal is to fit the correlators to this form. Normally, we're not going to use an infinite tower of states. That would be completely ridiculous because, of course, we only have a finite amount of data. In fact, because our data is so noisy, we're only going to be able to pull out one state, maybe two. It depends on what the quality of your data is. All right, so let's just talk about fitting just the ground state. We'll assume that our time is large enough that we can approximate this by a sub naught e to the minus e sub naught of t. That means we can fit the correlator using just two parameters. Our two parameters are the amplitude, that's some combination of the overlap factors between our creation and annihilation operators and the nucleon ground state, and the energy of the ground state itself, e sub naught. To find the best fit, what we want to do is vary these parameters, a sub naught and e sub naught. Each set of parameters is going to predict a value of our two-point function at each time. And we'll compare those predictions to the actual data and figure out which set of parameters seem the most likely. The most popular way to fit data in lattice QCD is called chi-squared minimization. That's where we try to minimize this function, which we call chi-squared. It's the sum over all time, t and t prime, of the value of our correlator, that is our actual data, minus the predictions of this uh, formula, a sub naught e to the minus e sub naught t. The same quantity over here, the correlator at some other time, t prime, and the prediction of our model for that time, and we connect these by some metric. In this case, that metric is the inverse of what's called the covariance matrix. Well, we just discussed autocorrelations earlier. The covariance is going to look very similar to that. It is the expectation value, the average over the fluctuations at, of the correlator at time t and the fluctuations at time t prime. It's as simple as that. If we could assume that the data's intertime correlation is not important, that is, there aren't significant correlations, the correlators are independent at different times, then we can just approximate this function 
the covariance matrix as the variance. Great, so that should look familiar. And so our chi-squared becomes the difference of the model from the data squared divided by the error bars. So the goal of the fit is to map all of our configurations, we have some correlator on each of our configurations, to an expected value, our mean value, our best prediction for these two parameters, a sub naught and e sub naught. Using a resampling technique, for example, the jackknife, you'll have to carry out this fit for each of the resampled data sets. So here we take our correlators on each of our configurations. We use the jackknife procedure in order to make a resampled data set. So we take our configurations, we knock out the first one, we knock out the second one, yada, 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 for all of the different configurations. Then we fit to this set and we get some prediction for our amplitude, we get some prediction for our energy. And we get that same prediction for each of the members of our resampled data set. Then we take the mean over those to get our final prediction. And because we've now done our resampling, we can also find the variance of that mean. Once we have our results in hand, we'd like to check whether or not they make any sense. One easy way to check the energies of the states in our two-point correlator is to use something called the effective mass. Take some correlator at time t plus 1, we divide it by the correlator at some time t, and then we take the logarithm. Well, what do we get when you do that? Well, each of these things is going to have a factor of e to the minus e sub 0, we're looking at the ground state, e sub 0 of t plus 1 divided by e to the minus e sub 0 of t. Obviously, it's going to be e to the minus e sub 0. We take the logarithm. Now we get minus e sub 0. We add a minus sign. Bam! We just got our effective mass. Now, you may notice that there's only one exponential in the equation that I just described to you. Where did the infinite tower go? Well, if we wait to large enough times, this exponential factor will suppress all of the excited states. The signals from each of the excited states is going to be decreasing exponentially as a function of time relative to the ground state. And if we look at some realistic data here, you can see time on the horizontal axis and the effective mass being plotted on the vertical axis. And indeed, you can see each of these correlators is dropping, dropping down to what we call a plateau, that is a long, flat region where we think we have approximately the ground state. And then at very large times, what we see is the signal to noise problem. But in the plateau region, we get some sort of a reasonable signal, which we can extract as the ground state. The difference between these two correlators that I've plotted here is that this is a zero momentum nucleon, and this is a nucleon that has some finite amount of momentum. That's the reason why it has a higher energy. This curved region at low times is what we call excited state contamination. It's only contamination, of course, if we're only interested in the ground state. Uh, it could be excited state signal if we had very high quality data and we thought we could extract an excited state from it. This red line shows the form that you would get if you fit this quantity to a single exponential, and this blue curve shows what you would find if you fit this to a sum over two exponentials, the ground state and the first excited state. And you can see that's a pretty good fit to this data.